Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome back. We are so glad to have you here with us today at Money on Tap. Again, my name is Seth Crossman. And I'm Ben Brayshaw. You can reach us at 855 226 8551 or info at your money on tap. Dot com. And uh, it is going to be some fun here today. Folks, if you're new, welcome. If, you're, uh, if you've been around the block a couple of times with Ben and I, we are so glad to have you back. And uh, we appreciate you and the calls that you uh, bring in and the connections and the communication. We have so much fun communicating and connecting with you guys. And that's why we do this. We like it. We like it. <laughs> <laughs> there was total, <laughs> absolute confidence in your voice right there, Ben. <laughs> no, it's fun. I mean, you know what? People come into the office, and it's it's great. We meet people that are listeners, and and we've helped a lot of people in a lot of different ways. So that is that is that's really where I find the joy. I think that's the most fun. But um, I think this this show keeps us on our toes a little bit sometimes, Seth. I'm kind of excited for today's show because this is a uh, this is a good one. You want to introduce? Yeah, sure. We're going to be talking about that uh, that old beat up uh, piece of life insurance or annuity the that jalopy. you have out there. Yeah, your jalopy of a of a uh, program that you've you know you've had it around for the last I don't know five, ten, twenty years, however long you could make that thing work. And now it usually starts, Seth, with a, a story about a, a, a an evening at your home with a life insurance salesman. Oh gosh. <laughs> It usually turns out to be a memory that no one has seemed to forget. It's like you remember your child's birth and then you remember the life insurance sale. (laughs) Oh, man. I wish we could. I so wish we could go ahead and attach some kind of like a uh, a, a volatility index to people's uh, blood pressure as as we say those words or we think about those (laughs) memories. (laughs) But hey, we're going to we're going to give you guys some hope today. That's what I'm excited for. But before we uh, before we get moving into that, Seth. We have Money in the News. I love that intro. That's so good. We get the music. We get the timing. We get the fun. We're going to be talking about, hey, what is what are the articles that we have coming across our desk as financial planners and uh, is interesting to us? And we think, you know what? We're just going to take a minute here. Do a little bit of a deep dive onto uh, some some money topics. For starters, GM plans to hire three thousand new workers, but they're you know that's not the everyday story where GM comes out and says we're going to hire three thousand uh, more workers. Period. But it's even better than that. These workers are going to be bolstering its engineering and soft software development for the EV car. The EV car. Everybody is EV. Everybody vehicle. Is that what it is? No, it's elect- electric. Oh, electric. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is this is really actually this is beautiful to see. If I mean, if you are a fan of America, American Steel, American Car, uh, this is really great to see. It's uh, I love GM. I love Ford. I love all of these vehicles uh, and manufacturers out there, and. Um, and one of the things that is really hot right now, of course, is the electric vehicle or the self-driving vehicle. And it has put them in a place where they got to figure it out. And their solution uh, really of opening up this platform to bring in new talent. And this is from Ken Morris, GM's vice, GM's vice president, um, is that the, you know, they figured it out how to quickly adjust and make this happen and move faster. And one of the things that they're doing is they're opening it up. The architecture is they're going to uh, bring in talent from all across the world. Now, I'm not necessarily as much of a, a fan of GM and no, no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm a fan, buddy. I, I drive a Chevy truck. I like my truck. Oh. Well, I'm just going to put an all American stamp on that, baby, and say <laughs> I'm all American, all. baby. I've got <laughs> I've got two I got two Chevy vehicles. 
I like I like Chevy. I feel like I'm supposed to disclose what I what mine are and my what you, one's one is Chevy and and that's all right. Yeah, there's another. It's another thing. You don't have to talk about you don't have to talk <laughs> about your Lamborghini, Seth. That's okay. No two cares. other vehicles are far from a Lamborghini. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to if you were to give the be given the offer from GM right now and say, hey, uh, yeah, I like the I like the numbers here. I like the project. Love the opportunity. Do you want to move to Detroit? No. Okay. Not in not in the cards, but neither was it in the article. So, you know, what's interesting, Seth, is all the work, the remote work that they're hiring. They're, they're literally competing against everyone across yeah. the globe for the top talent. Matter of fact, you know, and this isn't in the article, but GM took a stake in Nikola, which is a, you know, a, an electric vehicle company that they took a huge stake in it, which had all sorts of crazy, wild, you know, who knows what's going on with them now kind of stuff with the owner, the CEO having to step down and how it's crazy. But anyways, they are really aggressively, I guess is my point, going after the electric vehicle location. You know, they want to be a player in this space. They want to like launch a number of cars in that. And the thing is that they just came out with making, they just reported a $4 billion earnings profit. So they've got the money to fly with this thing. I mean, they're really aggressively ready to move. I wonder how much of this is going to come back to, you know, two different platforms, let's say, you know, where, um, you know, you've got the Microsoft type of a platform or the the Apple platform. And there was, you know, really, that's kind of what it was or in, in terms of owning the road and very different models. But I wonder if there's a part of them that are going to be really vying for this this piece of industry for the next 50 years. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, you just think about, I mean, I think about all the, the phones and everything going on, Seth. I think it's just a matter of time before we're literally just dropping our phone into a tray, and it, it is the car computer. It is your car. It's a piece of your car. Like, the the technology is driven off of that phone. Like, I, I see that just becoming a major component piece, and I think the technology that they're looking to drive, I have no I have no basis on any of this stuff, but I can only imagine that it's a, a very radical kind of deep, like you said, like it, the technology piece, whether it's Microsoft or whoever it is, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be like, you know, parasitic almost in its, uh, in its connection, I think, with our lives and our world. I don't know. That's Ooh, my... Paris parasitic connection Ooh, you heard it here folks <laughs> very the very first time um we've got a few of those things out there as a matter of fact we're, we've got some so we got to start time stamping some of these because we're going to come back and be telling people all about what we said first at money on tap next we're going to talk about not first but second you got it ben yeah i got it i got it right here this is a big one here folks um so this is right out of the wall street journal and uh this is from richard rubin and uh, the, the article's titled, Some Business Owners Can Avoid Cap on Deductions for, for State and Local Taxes, Treasury Says. That's the salt tax limitation that was capped at about $10,000, was capped at $10,000 in 2017. It says that the forthcoming rules would sanction state laws that let partnerships, other businesses, deduct all of their state taxes. Now, there's, there's been some workarounds on this that have been successful very successful in the, especially the C, the C Corp area and so forth and um, different pieces of people trying to get around this. But the average W-2 employee in person has not been able to manage that. And some of the flow through has been a problem as well. And they're actually looking at this and promising Steve Mutchen, who's the uh, um, Treasury Secretary, he's, he has promised that they're going to fix this problem or alleviate the problem at a small level. Now, for a lot of people, the the salt tax is a very aggressive, um, you know, Trump administration scenario. It was seen as something that where if you were in a state of high taxes, you could not deduct your state and local taxes. So if your, if your property taxes or any of the state and local taxes you paid – could only get deducted up to ten grand. So if you spent over ten thousand dollars on that, you did not get that full deduction. And this was seen as a very aggressive against the Democratic Party um, play by the Republicans, or at least the Democrats took it that way, because the the states that this tax 
change affected the most were the highest tax states out there, which was California, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts. It hit the the blue states the hardest, and it was almost a very aggressively seen play. And um, so there's some hope inside of the of the world of taxes where the salt tax cap will be lifted or alleviated in some capacity. And there is some promise of that um, potentially happening. Now, whether or not Trump is or isn't our next president, you know, kind of still remains to be seen as they figure out this vote scenario deal, which I think, you know, half the world thinks it's okay, half the world thinks it's not. And if you ask me, I don't care who the final ending person is, as long as we have integrity in our elections, um, though I did vote, you know, that is the most important thing out of this. And, um, but this alleviation piece is really very interesting for a lot of people because, you know, for those, for those business owners, this is, this is, there's a lot of workarounds coming here if you didn't have one to begin with. And I think that's the big, hey, we got to wait to see. It's being promised. Nothing here. But you heard it here first to know, be on the lookout for this because if, if there is some pullback on the tightening of this rule, it can be a huge tax savings for you if you're, if you're, if you're focused on this. You, you really got into the meat of that, of, uh, and I don't have a whole lot left to add. Number three, the iPhone. I'm excited for the show, Seth. I mean, I, I think we're both kind of like jumping back and forth because you know what? I think what I'm really excited about is the fact that there's so many people who really need help in this area and they're not getting it. I mean, I, I've seen more and more of it as people kind of get closer and closer to retirement. So sorry. I'm, I'm... No, really, it's, it's great because it's so much more important than the iPhone <laughs> and, and how many models of the iPhone are out there, Apple creating many, many more options for us. And it's kind of fun to see trends where what, what has it been for the last, I don't know, five, six years. It's been, you know, the, the phone has become the phablet. It's become larger and larger or the, uh, the, the, the cameras have become better and better. And it's really incredible what they're doing now, like filming feature length film, uh, movies with iPhones. I love that commercial. Um, but the smallest one of the the group, which that's the apparently the the next trend is, let's see again how small we can get us. Do you and now to take you back to when we started having our cell phones? Do you remember the little, the ones that would fit in the the palm of your hand, like yeah. a quarter of the size of your your hand? They were the tiniest little flip phone you've ever seen in your life. Yeah, no, I I, I still like those. <laughs> still, <laughs> I still I, use that. <laughs> no, I don't still use that. But you know, there is something lost in the convenience of something smaller. That's for sure, and. I'm kind of excited for a mini phone. I mean, I don't know if I'm jumping out to get one. Matter of fact, I don't think I'm jumping out to get anything new yet, but um, it's definitely interesting. So you're not standing in line for the new iPhone when they release them and signing up for the pre-orders and all that good stuff? No, I'm not even a 5G. I'm still kind of concerned about this whole weird 5G thing. There's a lot of... Seth, I don't know. Maybe I'm falling more into the conspiracy side of the world, but I think I want to you know, tread lightly in the... uh, (laughs) In the question mark world. I mean, do I think that 5G is something we're all going to have to accept and so forth? I do. I, I just don't know. I think there's a point in time where there's some there's some problem with the amount of speed that we're trying to push through the uh, the atmosphere here. But I don't know. We'll see. Well, yeah, there's a whole, whole bunch of other topics there. Actually, one of the articles that we did take a pass on was uh, a little bit of a 5G dip and who's doing better in this 5G race right now. Uh, and, uh, because it wasn't good news, we just left it alone. So, (laughs) (laughs) which is why I'm probably coming from that space right now. Sorry, folks. And, and, and honestly, you know, saying iPhone and Apple uh, a bunch of times on this podcast probably is going to get more people to like us in the long run. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know, I'll tell you though, it is, it, they, the, the article's interesting because it says that it's really not much bigger than the iPhone five, though. It seems like it is even. Yeah. That was interesting. So, I mean, it's tiny for what they're, what you're, I mean, I look at people using these Pro Max things and I'm like, I might as well just call, you know, carry an iPad around and hold the thing up to the side of my face and that's it. say hello. Yeah. You know, I mean, I don't know. I'm looking I, for smaller phones and I, uh, this is interesting. I'm pretty sure you could go back to a previous episode of Money on Tap and I probably said that. I'm, I'm confident I did because that's been my, my my little stick on these phablets here as I'm trying to reach. I mean, my hand is 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 
decent sized hand. And I have a hard time texting one handed on these things because they're so big. It's like cross the country, mail your thumb like 3000 miles over that direction to be able to hit that uh, it's, it's, numeric. Or, yeah, no, I was thinking about this too. While reading the article, I was thinking about how versatile I have become and I have large hands. So I was thinking about how versatile I have come to like allowing the phone to slide down my hand to touch the top of it and then yeah. somehow work it back up my hand without a second hand. And I've seen you do that driving down the highway eating five guys. <laughs> I don't sure. know how you I'm do sure. it, Ben. You are incredible. I'm sure you've seen me do some pretty stupid <laughs> things, Seth. Thank you. So uh, I want... <laughs> just keep sharing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, hey, I'm going to bring us back back down a minute because, you know, you can't have it all. I mean, you get to with us, of course, right? Because that's what we do with three-dimensional investing here. <laughs> Money on tap at Brace Shop Financials. You get it all. Um, but apparently in iPhone's world, you just cannot have it all. And with the, the smaller version, the mini, you are going to suffer folks when it comes to your battery. And, uh, I know that's been an issue for the, the Apple products in the past and might as well just stay consistent with that. So be prepared with a charger at all times. Price is pretty good though. I mean, look at this thing. It's six ninety nine. I mean, compared to wow. like, like over a thousand bucks or a thousand bucks for the the Pro or the Pro Max. I mean, that's uh, yeah. that's a sizable saving. So if you're looking for a quick yeah. phone, and you know most people do carry an, either an extra battery or something around with them, anyways, because they never know how they're using it. I, I think this is no big deal. You know, I mean, it's got a little bit shorter battery, but if you're really looking for a more you know compatible phone just to have on you for the day, and you're sitting at your desk, boom, charge the thing. You know, at that price, we could probably afford to. Um you know, give one of those to each of our listeners that calls us today and asks us about <laughs> the iPhone. Or maybe not that much. We could pop. We could possibly just ask for Seth. Just ask for <laughs> Seth's extension. <laughs> I might. I might actually be. I might actually debate. You know, upgrading and then handing down my phone to the next generation because I've never actually bought a phone for. Either yeah. my kids. So just to, just to wrap this up, we got a few few seconds left here. But um, the iPhone Mini is only supposed to last about ten and a half hours, where the iPhone twelve models last about fourteen. So it's it's significantly it's forty percent more. That's a that's a big deal. It's worth considering. That's it, folks. I'm so glad that you brought us back to something that's really important instead of me talking about my kids on here. All right, that's going to do it for money in the news. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. We'll be talking about trading in that old jalopy. That uh, old insurance policy you've got that's sitting around, not doing you any good anymore. Take a look at the new one. See what we got. We'll be right back. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Hi, my name is Seth Crussman, partner with Brayshaw Financial Group and one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. One of the biggest concerns and largest expenses people face today is taxes. Without thoughtful planning, taxes can destroy future retirement dollars, eliminating the possibility of a timely retirement or dreams of what you want retirement to look like. If you're like most people, you're getting closer and closer to retirement, and you may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. Will my income be enough? Will rising taxes force me to give up my dreams? How does inflation factor into all of this? These are real concerns and you're not alone. Putting a plan around your financial future is what we do. If you have questions when it comes to your financial security, and if you're looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group, 855-226-8551. It's time for you to start getting answers to your questions. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, Brayshaw Financial has offices across the country. We'd love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation to meet with us. Call us at 855-226-8551. 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. You are listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We're wondering, is it time for you to trade in your old jalopy annuity or life insurance policy? Is that what you're driving around in? Do you have, do you have this... 
this annuity that's kind of been out there and you know, you bought this thing or, or you've been contributing to this thing for years and you haven't really given it a second thought. It made sense at the time. Well, the wheels may be ready to come off of that. <laughs> it may have served a purpose at the, that time to, to, you know, to, it was your commuter rig uh, and was, as a, it was working at the moment. But did you know that you can actually, you can possibly trade that in? You know, Seth, it's it's funny because there's so many people out there that own annuities or life insurance, and and there's a lot of people that come in that say, I've got this thing for, I've had this life insurance policy. My mom bought it for me. My dad bought it for me. Um, I, it's just got a bunch of Thanks, cash mom. in it. Yeah, right. I mean, it, <laughs> I just don't even know what to do with it. Is it valuable? And then we have the the kind of the other piece that is, I bought this annuity from somebody who I haven't heard from in. 10 years, 15 years, and I'm not sure what this thing is or what it does. So common. It's so complicated, and I don't understand. You know, what do I do? And honestly, the number one question people have is like, how's this going to affect me tax-wise? You know, like if I do something with this thing and, you know, I mean, is there like, is there tax implications? Am I going to, you know, how's that going to all come into play? And fees. Fees. Right? Yeah. I mean, there's just a zillion different questions that people have on these things. And honestly, most of these contracts, especially the annuity side, have almost an unlimited number of variables that if you don't kind of have the background to know what to look for, you kind of have yourself like not able to write. You know, I was I, one thing I ask people is, what's the one question I haven't asked that I should ask? <laughs> you know, and uh, I, I literally use that from time to time. And I think that's the way with the annuities are, is that when you contact some of these insurance companies, you don't know what these annuities actually can do or what they're capable of because there's so many distant avenues of things you can potentially do with them to compare. And uh, I'm excited to get into this show because there's a lot of people out there with questions on this stuff that just don't go and talk to somebody about it. So so first off, I want to uh, make clear a couple of things. First of all, you are listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at your money on tap. Now, why would you want to pick up the phone and give us a call, send us an email. First and foremost, Ben and I are financial planners. That's what we do. The name of our company is Brayshaw Financial Group. Uh, and that happens to be Ben's last ni- name. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> but the fact is, is that this is what we work in all the time. We're not here uh, trying to sell insurance products, or we don't have a bent really on what it is that we do in this financial planning world. We focus on three-dimensional investing. Insurance and annuities are a part of that, are part of that solution, or what can be a solution for your financial plan. And they they might be something that serves a purpose for a point in time, but you've had it for a while, and you really do need to try to understand: Does this still work for me today? For what I want to do going forward. And in that transition, right, Ben and I get an opportunity to not just uh, uh, wear this hat or that hat. We kind of put them all together to make sure that we're putting you in the best place possible. Now, Ben described an, uh, an interesting circumstance that we see all the time. Matter of fact, I just had a, uh, a flyer on my desk here, which was an invitation to go out and eat and listen to a presentation. And when I took a look at that, I was like, oh, well, this is you know, I see these a lot, but when I took a look at that, that the person that was presenting, all they did was life insurance. That's all that organization does. So can you guess what you're going to get when you walk out the door of that presentation? Yes. Yeah. And that's, and that's pretty common. You know, I mean, there's, there's people that just do one side or another. We call it, we call it three dimensional investing. I've even called it the three legged stool. And, you know, insurance is definitely a piece of the stool that, is a big issue, you know, and then, uh, and then there's crossover. People don't really realize that sometimes you have to be securities licensed and insurance licensed to work in some of the insurance products because they have a securities component to them. And then the managed money piece and the fiduciary piece, all that stuff, it starts wrapping into, you know, this kind of three-legged stool. And we all know a two-legged stool doesn't, doesn't balance itself. And so it's kind of hard to really have a kind of an unbiased perspective without really being able to provide all the options to a client. And that's that's one of the things we want to do. And I really, I'm really i really excited about talking about this one leg of the stool today. And I think that, you know, what people 
what people first off have is they, they don't know what they have. They don't know what kind of insurance product they own. Usually there's, there's life insurance, there's annuities, and then there's variables, right, inside all of those items. You've got whole life, term insurance, index universal life, universal life, variable universal life. It's like the, a litany of... <laughs> there's a lot of... A lot of life's in there. A lot of life's in there. And then you've got the annuity world, and you've got fixed annuities, immediate annuities, equity index annuities, variable annuities. I mean... I feel like I need a Google translator or some kind of an app that's going to take everything you just said and spit it back in some recognizable English to me. Yeah, no, that's probably... Are you going to do that? It's probably clearer in Chinese if I said it. You know, it it is just... uh, (laughs) There's just a lot of this stuff that people don't understand. And so... What our first offer is today is if you find yourself buried now and you still find yourself buried after this conversation, give us a call. We're happy to talk to you about what you own uh, see if we can give you some guidance and some understanding. But the first thing we want to kind of cover is the concept that, hey, you have, a, you have an old life insurance policy. You have an old annuity. You know that, that they don't fit you. There's nothing, there's nothing about it that makes sense as far as you can tell. And you're thinking about trading in that old jalopy. Seth, what's what's the one thing about trading in this old jalopy? Trading well first of all the, there's the simple part where where I think I want to focus and try to come back to uh what are some takeaways? We're going to give you some of those takeaways, but the simple part is is that you can trade that in. That's possible. Right? There's and and especially when we're talking about some kind of a cash value in that and if it's an annuity it might have a couple of different components to that. There's, there might be this, this account value, which is like the true cash value. Or if you're talking about life insurance, it's going to have a cash value to that life insurance. Okay, so, well, then what do you mean trade it in, Seth? Why would I do that? What, what would the options be? And the process, if you want to try to capture this tax code out there that's called 1035, would be called a 1035 exchange. Yeah, and I think that's that's good. I mean, it's you know, if you say, did I answer your question? Because y- y- yeah, I sh- no, you're dead on. I mean, okay. <laughs> w- one of the things about this is that the ability to get rid of an annuity and maybe get into an annuity that is more suited for you, whether it's an income death benefit feature, long term care feature. All these annuities have all these different riders you can buy out there. Um, you could potentially exchange that, and that 1035 exchange is that thing that allows you to do this without paying any taxes. It allows you to move from point A to point B without paying any taxes because option- so what would be taxable? Let's just talk about that without paying any taxes. Why? Why would there be a portion of 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 this that would be taxable if I just decided, hey, I just want to take the cash value and go buy a car? So great, great them. question. I was and I was kind of running that direction already. So the the concept of the first option could be Seth, right? You know, you've got the you put a hundred thousand dollars in an annuity, okay. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a post-tax annuity, something you've done with savings. Okay. And now it's worth $150,000 and you decide to liquidate that. Okay. Um, so I've paid a hundred, I've paid taxes already on a hundred thousand. And then there's this 50,000 that's accumulated there that I, that's, is that the gains or the growth? Yeah, that's the gains of the growth, but it's not taxed as gain. Now, not now taking age out of the equation here, because if you liquidate, an annuity prior to 59 and a half, you're going to have penalties, okay? Um, just like an IRA retirement plan would have. But if you take the money out, it's going to be taxed as ordinary income. I mean, if you if you liquidate it in that scenario, you're going to have a $50,000 gain that's going to be taxed as income, which means that's going to add an income level to you. To you. So if you're already making a decent living, uh, and you let's say you're making eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, and you add fifty thousand bucks. I mean, that's going to be taxed at right now, currently around twenty two percent in taxes, not counting maybe penalties if you're under fifty nine and a half. So you're you're kind of looking at some pretty heavy tax burden there, um, pushing yourself all the way into a, another tax bracket, even potentially. So whoa, whoa, whoa! Put on the brakes. I don't want to do that, right? Exactly. It's, exactly. Yeah, but you know, I like that I've got this money over here. I've accumulated, but maybe 
I maybe what I'm getting off of that is, you know, something around 3% or whatever, if it's a fixed product, something, I don't know, whatever yeah. it is. Let's, let's say it's a return scenario, right? I'm not super excited about the return I've been getting off of this or, uh, or I the have fees, seen the fees are too heavy or, or something. Fees, yeah, lots of fees. So there's, so there's something about this that I'm looking at and I'm like, gosh, you know, that just doesn't make sense to me. So I've got this, uh, this, this path of 1035 that would allow that exchange or that that cash value of say the original hundred plus the fifty thousand that's there to go ahead and relocate from where it's been warehoused over here in this annuity into what are the options? Is that where we're at next? Yeah, and I think I think the thing is is that with with most people, and the reason we're kind of talking kind of around the the curve of just like that's everyone kind of does a ten thirty five. If for people who own annuities or life insurance, they know there's something complicated about the liquidation, right? They know there's something there. They're not sure what it all is. They don't. They know there's surrender fees. They know there's potentially penalties. They know there's taxes. They know there's all these different pieces, and they're, they're just not sure how to handle it. So, the government has given us this ability to say you can you can swap from one item to another. Now, it's important here that we just just clarify this. We're going to get this into get into this a little bit more in a, in a bit, but you can go from a life insurance contract cash value to an annuity. And you can go from an annuity contract to another annuity contract. But you cannot take your cash value from an annuity and go into a life insurance contract tax-free. That is the Whoa, no-no. Say that again. Yeah, I'm going to say it one more time. So you can go from a life insurance to a life insurance. You can go from an annuity to an annuity. And you can go from a life insurance to an annuity, but you can't go backwards. You can't go from an annuity into life insurance under the 1035 code. Even though I don't like that, I still can't do it? That doesn't change it? That's correct. Well, I thought that that's how it worked. If I don't like something, the rules need to change to apply for me. Yes, that's a political scenario, Seth. We're not going to go there today. (laughs) There seems to be a lot of rhetoric out there like that, doesn't there? (laughs) It sure does. It sure does. Well, and and I don't want to go into that too much right now, but the the concept is is that people know that the the there's a complication around annuities. And right. there there's no such thing as a good or bad investment. There's only suitable and unsuitable. So, if you bought something and you don't like it, it or you think it's bad, it's probably that it was just unsuitable for you and then maybe you need to sit down with somebody and figure out how to get yourself into a better, more suitable scenario with the least penalties, issues and problems. Now, there's a lot of this, Seth. I mean, how many times do we have people walk through the door that say, hey, I bought this thing, and it seemed right at the time. It seemed to meet my goals and objectives, but it no longer does. And that happens pretty, I mean, not every day, but I would say frequent enough that it's an issue. Absolutely. That's one of the first things that we highlight here when taking a look at, you know, is a what are the factors when assessing a 1035 exchange? You really want to look at what are your goals Okay, first and foremost, I mean, believe it or not, you know, the fees and the process or, you know, the next greatest thing that's crossed your your path as far as, you know, intriguing or getting your interest and looking like it's a hot ticket. Those are not the factors that you need to look at first. Goals, 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 folks. So, you know, before considering, just take a look. What were your goals then? Then that's good clarity for you to take a look back and take a look at what are they currently and potentially, we you know, we want to try to pull this into perspective 5, 10, 20 years, maybe down the road. After that, I would say, really, then our second, our second piece is, what are your fees or what are the limitations? For instance, you know, Ben just described <clears throat> the taxability where you cannot go from the annuity into an exchange to a life insurance product without it being a taxable event. OK, so we need to kind of understand what are the corridors or what are the paths? What are what are some of those limitations? But more often than not, when you if let's just say that this is an annuity or it is a, a life insurance policy, when you purchased these, they had surrender fees associated with them or some kind of a schedule like that. And they don't typically last forever. They usually have kind of this reducing fee year after year. Say it's a a 10-year surrender fee, you know, year one through two uh, that you've had this. So that's a a cost I have to pay to get out of the investment. Right. 
Right. And that and, and and frankly, that's usually one of those things on the front side of these that in the past they weren't necessarily. Uh, well, we've we've just the, there's a conversation around <laughs> whether or not those were fully disclosed. Sometimes um, there needs to be full disclosure and understanding around what are the costs to doing anything that you're going to be doing. And if there isn't a full disclosure, or a full conversation around that, I usually would advise people to run. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point. You know, I think I think the thing that our industry does well is we explain the benefits of a lot of things. Like, you know, hey, if you go into this, this is all the benefits. But you have to look backwards. You really have to dig into what are the costs, what are the fees, what are the I mean, even with life insurance co- companies, you might own a life insurance policy that has a really low insurance cost in an underlying scenario where the the amount you pay to be insured by that company is lower than the potential average cost of what maybe you're going into. And you have to take that into account, even though this thing might have a new bag of tricks, uh, riders, benefits, whatever it's featuring, maybe it could sound great. And and it really could be the right thing for you. And, And sometimes paying more is the right thing. I mean, I've I think about when every time you have more kids, like you need a bigger and bigger vehicle, right? So you end up paying more and more for the vehicle. Well, that's the right thing sometimes. So, you know, sometimes costs do go up because you have new needs or new goals. And um, that's, a, that's a great point. One of the other things with those surrender fees or those schedules is a lot of the time there's a um, kind of a hurdle, like a fee hurdle before the product uh, will start really truly accomplishing what was outlined originally by this, uh, by this, the features and the benefits and everything else. Just the way that those the contracts typically work is the fees and the costs are front loaded in those. So taking a look at what those currently what the fee situation is, what is it is it going to cost to get out? All right, and what the new uh, opportunity or the next contract looks like, because there's going to be potentially a whole new set of fees and hurdles and um, surrender schedules involved with that as well. So be very clear with those things. As we kind of go into evaluating what you did own, evaluating what you are considering purchasing or maybe moving to versus a liquidation is something that takes a lot of expertise. Okay, and I'm going to I'm going to kind of go backwards a little bit because when it comes into evaluating a new investment, one of the things is understanding the financial strength of the company you have and the financial strength of the company you're going into. And and those are very, very obvious kind of important things that people look at. The other thing is, is that, um, and so I'm speaking more specifically right off the bat to annuities, because annuities have traditionally many, many variables of riders, whether it's an income rider, a withdrawal feature, um, a, a long-term care benefit kind of play, or a um, death benefit feature, or I mean, there's a you know, there's a bunch of different. They create access to your your funds in a lot of different ways and annuities for people who have specific concerns, but, and that's that's something that could be a value. But you also have to understand what you do own, and so there's a lot of different ways to get money out of an annuity. For instance, you can have withdrawal features in old annuities. You could have annuitization in an old annuity, and you could have income riders in an old annuity. Now, the thing is, is you could be going to one annuity that has a better income rider versus um, and a worse annuitization feature. And those are different ways to take money out. And one is a guaranteed feature in one capacity. One's a guaranteed feature in another capacity. And, and understanding the intricacies of that stuff is you could be giving up one benefit that you might actually need or a way of accessing money and not be accomplishing that with a new program. You might be not understanding all the ways to access your income is really what I'm saying. And being able to compare that takes probably two or three phone calls because I got to tell you, we have staff who will call in to companies, right, Seth? I mean, they'll call in, (laughs) they'll call in to get information about some of the riders and they don't understand everything we know about these things. And they'll come back to me and I'll say, oh, did you ask about this rider? Because I know that that investment has this rider. She'll call back and the, and the person won't even know about the rider. <laughs> it's crazy. And, and these companies aren't even aware, even their internal staff sometimes, I mean, these big call centers, they don't know all the features of all the different products that they've created. It's, it's nuts. So this is a very complicated area and I, I don't want to get too deep into it other than to just be the big... Yeah, we said we we're going to be simple here, right? 
but I wanted to be, I wanted to create enough awareness that there's, there's, there's a big black hole here that buyer beware. You need to understand there's usually always more than one way to get income out of your program. And so you're probably going to want to be able to compare that properly. So on a wrap on this, uh, this little piece here, right before we take a break, there is something to, there's the question of, are there fees purely for a 1035 exchange? Okay. And the answer to that simply is, is no, there are no in within 1035 exchange code. There is not something that designates some kind of a fee in that code to go through this process. It really is the policy on one side and the policy on the other that really truly dictate what are those fees for transition. Okay. Well, that's exciting. And we, we actually have so much more that we can't wait to get to. Uh, and it really is it is really a thrilling opportunity as you take a look at what are what are some of these different opportunities that people have in the future or what are they looking at currently and transitioning from and to. And it's really a nice, nice place if you're there to take a look. Give us a call at Money on Tap, 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We're going to be right back. Hi, my name is Ben Brayshaw, one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. If you have questions when it comes to your retirement and are looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group. In today's volatile stock market, we can help you plan to find your successful retirement solution. Am I saving enough? Am I saving into the right places? Do my investments match my appetite for risk? Do I have a tax strategy that is going to help me keep more of what I earn? How can I maximize my Social Security income? If you are like most people, you are getting closer and closer to your retirement and may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. If you're in retirement, you may be wondering, am I maximizing my income while preserving my estate and caring for my family? We talk about all things financial in what we call three-dimensional investing, putting a plan around your financial future. If you feel that now is the time to start getting the answers to some of these questions for your own situation, give us a call at Brayshaw Financial Group at 855-226-8551. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, we have offices throughout New England and across the country. We would love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation just to meet with us, and we welcome you to our office. Call us at 855-226-8551. Now back to Money on Tap with Ben and Seth. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Again, my name is Seth Crossman, and sitting across from me here is Ben Brayshaw. He's a little shy sometimes on the mic, but he's ready to go here in any any second. Not shy. <laughs> <I'm> very... <laughs> <laughs> We're a, we've been talking about 1035 exchanges. Uh, that is That's something in the insurance world that allows for a tax-free exchange to happen from one policy to another. And we've been kind of disclosing a lot of the, the, in the ins and the outs around fees and, you know, what those potentially can look like. What are some of the, what are some of the hangups? What are some of the, we haven't, we haven't really talked about the benefits other than really this is a process that, that allows for money flow from one place to another without taxing it in that process, which uh, can ultimately uh, be a, be a great way for somebody to trade in that old life insurance policy, that old annuity policy that was great at the time, but maybe there's just too many other things that it's not doing right now that something on the other side could accomplish. So we focus on the goals. We ask ourselves these questions. What do I need this for? What purpose is it serving? And we start to take that conversation from there. So there was, we did we we did miss we didn't miss we just we just didn't quite have time we're going to we wanted to we wanted to talk about partial annuity exchanges yeah i mean you know the fact is is there's a lot of ways the exchange can occur and you know some people say well you know i've got a huge annuity it's grown it's a big number now and and so forth you can actually move part of your annuity out to another annuity um and that's something to look at. With life insurance, you can move part of your cash value out and sometimes even reduce your death benefit to still make it, you know, 
plausibly functional potentially and uh, and move that cash to something especially for people who really need they're like hey listen I, I don't need life insurance anymore I need money to retire that's a really common scenario now we have five things here that we want to give you to look for and I'm going to kind of rattle these off a little bit and talk briefly on them the first one is is that a lot of people buy fixed annuities that look and smell like CDs as we call them like it's a fixed rate of return it's tax deferred because annuities are tax deferred if they're non-qualified well, even qualified are because they're naturally qualified or tax deferred. But with a fixed annuity, you might have a rate of two or three or four or five five percent. It could be an old one paying a ridiculously good rate. You gotta make sure you're going into a an annuity with a better rate, right? I mean that's that's kind of obvious. I think everyone knows that. But one thing that people don't really take into account is this piece when you're looking at a new annuity. That's the surrender charge schedule. That's that fee to get out that we talked about earlier where you know, you're signing up for a whole new schedule, Seth. I mean, it's it could be something that might be longer than the time horizon in which you need the money, if it's specifically a liquid event, like if you need liquidity and it's a fixed annuity. Or I also know that there's annuities that have income riders that you need to really be careful of because they don't actually start until after a number of years. It could be three years or five years, and there's features around those. Or or maybe the benefit you're looking for isn't even until 10 years out. There's a lot of There's a lot of issues you need to make sure of because... If you buy a, a product that you have to wait five or ten years to start an income feature that you're counting on and you have a health change in the middle of that, that could be devastating financially, especially if you have to pay that surrender fee to get out to maybe redo things. The third one here we have, and Seth, I'll toss this your way, you know, check the riders that you, you have, check the riders that you're looking to buy and see if they, if like the guarantee on them is in the range of where you need to be. And that's a big issue. It is. So some of what riders, this is uh, one of those, one of those terms that we're just so familiar with and able to kind of interchange around the conversation that we're having with you. But what does that mean? Okay. So riders are kind of like these, these, uh, we're going to go back to the jalopy, uh, the jalopy example. You've got this, uh, old life insurance policy. You've got this old annuity. And at that time, it it was great. It had all the bells and whistles, right? But that's that's 10, 20 years ago, say. So if if you're looking at a vehicle today, how many of those features just come standard with what you're looking at? And how many of these new things are like, well, we've got this nav over here or we've got this 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 mirror this this camera behind me that I can see everything and there's all these safeguards and it's a self-driving car or something like that, right? <laughs> so there's all these kind of upgrades that you could take a look at and those are just the features around the package or the tax code of that annuity or life insurance. And so lining those up and seeing, well, are we going to be taking a step down because you could you could, you know, after 20 years, there might have been some really great rider out there that you bought that annuity for that may no longer be available. But the riders could be guaranteed death benefits on those off of, you know, whatever the highest value of the account was uh, or a guaranteed income benefit. OK, or some kind of a, a floor on the rate of return with, you know, an opportunity for more market in terms of that income account value as those riders, you know, kind of lock in some or step in and, and lock in some of these gains on those income account values. Or there's, those are kind of some different ways that these products can work. But if you take a look at that, if you exchange out of that, you could be walking away from something that you've built up that may or may not have a way to offset yeah, on and the I, writer side. You know, Seth, you make you make great points. I mean, really, we just got to you got to be really super careful. I mean, we're talking in a lot of generalities here, and that's and that, that's just because there's so many different features out there. But there are so many pieces to these annuities that have so many benefits and features that they're designed for that some people don't realize what they really own could be great. It really could be great. I mean, I've you know, I, I tell you, sometimes you, you like. You know, they're not the old jalopy you thought you had. Like, you know, you hear about something great and new and everything else, and it's just a different bag of tricks. And insurance companies just trying to lock up your money. So you got to be careful that you're not giving up something that you've already paid for because the big issue here is you're paying fees in for these annuities. And if you don't realize you're paying for a service and you're buying something from them, and 
if you get rid of that, all that stuff you bought was just money lost. And so all you get is what you put in plus whatever intrinsic gain that they've credited you minus any fees to get out. And so that's something you really have to evaluate. Was it worth paying for all that insurance for a certain period of time? And honestly, when it comes to life insurance, you hope that you wasted your money on life insurance and you lived a really long time. I mean, that's kind of the hope, right? So, so sometimes paying a fee for feeling insured is a good situation, even when it comes to an annuity. The other thing is, is checking that time horizon, you know, checking checking in and making sure it meets that. We talked a little bit about that and, and making sure that your income is in play. And, you know, Seth, you had brought up earlier when we were doing the show discuss on this, which is, you know, your insurability. You know, you know I, we, how, Seth, I have had people who have done life insurance tests discover that they're very ill, thinking they were quite healthy. I've also had people, I also had one woman, a very good friend of mine, who had an insurance contract with a large cash value in it. And I was able to find a new insurance product that gave her more death benefit because that was the only thing she wanted to do was leave money to the family. And it was a higher death benefit sacrificing the cash value. Um, but she, you know, you, when you usually with cash value, you either get the death benefit or the cash value. You don't get both. And so this was her goal. And, um, you know, less than two years later, she, um, she passed away. And it was, uh, it was a very sad time for me. And um, But uh, she didn't discover it from that, but uh, there's uh, obviously she got insured. So, but, there, they, you know, health changes happen suddenly and unexpectedly. That's, that's just the way they come, and um, it's something to be aware of. So before we get going here, folks, I know that there's some of you that have got your, your pen and paper handy, and you're just, you can't wait to get the checklist. You, you need that checklist, so I've got it here for you. Here's some steps if, of the 1035 process. Number one, decide if it makes sense uh, for a 1035 of your existing policy. Two, choose a policy to 1035 into. Three, contact the insurer that holds your existing policy so you understand their paperwork requirements. There will be paperwork loads of paperwork <laughs> fill out. And then we're going to, number four, fill out and submit the application for the new annuity, including 1035 transfer request form. And then there is number five, the issue of that new contract. So information that you're going to want to grab to uh, send over to Ben and I, uh, so we can take a look at this with you is well, number one, the name of the product and insurance company. This will help us track down any additional information. Then there's the surrender fee schedule that we talked about. Help us determine if this makes sense. There's the cash value or account value, depending on the type of policy you have. Any riders or annuitization options that you know about in the contract policy number or any recent statements. That's a good start for you folks. Okay. Uh, and certainly it's it's what we're here to do. We're here to help. And you grab that information. Give us a call here at Money on Tap at 855-226-8551 and talk to Ben or myself. And we'll help you understand the landscape around the decision that's so important for you to make in, in any kind of a trade in on that policy. Yeah, this is a great this is a great piece to the to, to one of the legs of the stool, which is so part of everyone's life. No one wants to talk about insurance or any version of it, but it is truly a critical part to planning. Thanks, Seth. Thank you. You've been listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. You can also find us at Facebook. We're at backslash 3D investing. We're also on Twitter at BFG underscore LLC. And as always, you can also find us at yourmoneyontap.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for liking our podcast. We appreciate you. And we can't wait to make it a great day and a great life with you here at Money on Tap. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. 
result. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group, LLC, are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire, 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551. Well, bye.